But before we start with his talk, Mike, before we start with John's talk, I want to let you know that our next community conversations will be with Patty Schaffner, our new senator. And she's going to do a listening session for us, and that'll be on the 25th of April. It's a Wednesday. Um, it's from 7 to 8.30, and it's going to be in the city council chambers in, um, right here in the nominee. So we hope you can be there for that. I'll send, most of you I have on my email list, so I can let you know, um, you know, later on, give you a forewarning about this coming up. And I'm going to also send around a sign-up sheet, so if you're not on my email list, um, <coughs> feel free to sign up and we'll, you know, let you know what the meetings are going to be and what the topics are, and then afterwards we'll send you summaries. So we'll just start here in the front row. If we are on it, you don't want us to resign. No, you don't have to resign up if you're already on it. So anyway, this is my friend John Calabrese, who I met two years ago through community conversations. John has been working with Wolfpack to try to bring democracy back to our state. He's been working with the legislators down in Madison, talking to them, trying to encourage them to um, change the Constitution so that we can bring <coughs> the money out of politics. And that is through saying that when we people um, have the rights from the Constitution, not the corporations, not the unions, not the PACs, not the nonprofits, but that we have to respect that the Constitution was written for people. And the other thing is that money <coughs> is not speech. So John's been working on that, trying to get a constitutional um, amendment for that talking directly with our um, legislature, leg legislators. So, but tonight he's going to be talking about public campaign financing, uh, which is a topic close to his heart. So John is a 42-year-old carpenter, and he's been living in uh, this area for about six years, am I correct? Mm -hmm. And we're so glad to have him come join us now in Menominee. So, take it away, Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Well, this is uh, pretty fun for me, pretty interesting, and I've never done one of these before, so when I become a world-famous presenter of things, <laughs> you, can say, you can say you saw the first one. Uh, also, you can, uh, you'll can you have to bear with me, and it'll hopefully be uh, a little entertaining and fun. I found this cool uh, PowerPoint app that has some... Uh, interesting things on it and uh, and so you know I Lorene offered um, this to me to make a presentation about public finance and, and as I researched it a little bit more um, I, I ended up um, learning more about corruption through the years and, and so the majority of it is not specifically about public finance but we get there and uh, so just, just to enjoy, and afterwards, um, I mean, hopefully you'll find it informative and learn some things, and then afterwards, if you have some questions, we'll see if I can answer them. Uh, but hopefully you'll, uh, you'll learn a few things, and, and uh, let's just do it. So I'd like to thank the University and Levine for, for bringing me here, and uh, the community conversations are, are really important, and a lot of people uh, rely on them to, to get information and uh, it's a nice way to bring the community together on, on uh, various topics so I appreciate that and it's really cool that I get to be a part of it. So my name is John Calabrese like Lorene said and um, I live here in Menominee, just moved here recently. I used to live over in the town of Tiffany in Dutton County for uh, about five years and um, when I started to become politically engaged and concerned um, about my country and about my planet uh, in the world around me, I was drawn, as most good citizens are, uh, to take a little bit of action. Uh, I was born in western New York. Let's see if this picture works. Come on now. Maybe it won't. Um, there it is. Oh, look at that. See? Oh, it might leave now since I just hit it twice, but we'll get this going. I have about 10 minutes from where I grew up, Letchford State Park. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, they call it the Grand Canyon of the East. Anyway, I put that up there because it's lovely and because my father worked for the DEC in, in New York, which is the equivalent of the DNR. He's a game warden. I walked across that bridge. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's way up. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, and so my parents were conservative, but, but uh, they taught me um, to appreciate the land and the earth and the water. And, and, uh, and so my first foray into any sort of activism, um, I became increasingly concerned about climate change. Uh, and, and the more I learned, the more fearful I became about the future of our planet. And I added a couple kids to my heart and my home, and, um, and that added to my concern. And they're back there, they're the, the cutest ones. Uh, oh, there's another one too. I didn't mean anything to do with uh, I just meant compared to all of you. Uh, but anyway, uh, so my wife and I decided we should uh, get involved in some way more than you know, the general personal things you can do, like eating less meat and biking and plastic bags and recycling and, and stuff like that. Uh, and so we did some work with Bill McKibben's environmental group, 350.org, and we rode a, uh, a train from Minneapolis <coughs> down to D.C. to protest the Keystone XL pipeline in front of Obama's uh, White House. But then as I paid more and more attention to the news, my focus began to shift. And I know uh, you probably heard the term intersectionality uh, recently in, in regards to all sorts of things, but I like that uh, in a political sense. Um, and it started to become clear to me that in American politics, the one thing that intersects everything, there's just one thing, there's just one issue uh, that intersects all the others. Um, and so you ask yourself why? Why were significant changes and legal ramifications not handed down after the greed and malfeasance of huge banks led to the worldwide financial crash in 2008? And why did the defense budget and military excursions and weapons deals continually grow no matter which political party is in control? And why are we the wealthiest nation the face of the earth has ever seen, still the only industrialized nation that doesn't guarantee health care to its people? And why do we continue to embrace oil and gas exploration and industrial food and animal agriculture that are pushing our ecosystem to the brink instead of dramatically and rapidly shifting to sustainable and renewable forms of energy and agriculture? Why? It's the money, Lebowski. <laughs> it's the money. It's always the money. The halls of Congress and our state houses have become auction houses. Um, Harvard professor Larry Lessig, who many see as the godfather of the uh, campaign finance movement, he says, in a time of polarized politics, there's one thing that more than 90% of Americans agree on, that our government is broken, and broken because of the money in politics. Since the mid-70s, the United States political system has gone almost completely off the rails. It's a system of legalized corruption, plain and simple. And so corruption, um, it's a part of our human existence. It's just a, a thing that, that humans end up doing. Uh, you can't win a war against corruption. It's kind of like trying to win a, a, a war on terror. Um, you can fight terrorism. You can fight terrorists. But you're never going to defeat terrorism. And you're never going to defeat corruption. It's just a thing that you have to keep uh, trying to beat back. Um, and so corruption existed in the earliest governments. Uh, historian Ramsey McMullen of Yale University says of the Roman Empire, Bribery and abuses always occurred, <coughs> but by the 4th and 5th centuries they had become the norm. No longer abuses of a system, but an alternative system in itself. The cash nexus overrode all other ties. Everything was bought and sold. Public office, including army commands, judges' verdicts, and tax assessments. Access to authority on every level, and particularly the emperor. The traditional web of obligation became a marketplace of power, ruled only by naked self-interest. You can look back at ancient China. Journalist Andra Suska says of that, corruption in China dates back over a thousand years and has been present through countless dynasties. In fact, widespread corruption is often cited as one of the factors that led to the collapse of the Qing dynasty in the 19th century. One of the most infamous corrupt state officials was He Shen, the prime minister of Emperor Queen Long. He accumulated his wealth during two decades in office, and in 1799, he lost the emperor's trust, and the court ordered an investigation against him. Around 1,100 million teals of silver were discovered when his home was searched, an amount equivalent to the revenue of the king government for 15 years. His wrongdoings ended when, at the age of 49, he was given a court decree to hang himself. 
<laughs> That's what I read. It was on the internet. <laughs> and so corruption follows us through the ages. Uh, the corruption and hubris of the British East India Company is what led in large part to the American Revolution. As the founders and European immigrants came to the New World and decimated the native tribes on the eastern side of the North American continent, they also revolted against the heavy hand of the British Empire. They established a government guided by a constitution, and in an age of monarchy and empire, the founding fathers created a revolutionary democratic government, <coughs> ostensibly run by the people. And yes, at that time, the people meant white male landowners, but they were wise enough to outline a mechanism to alter the laws and the constitution as generations passed. In so doing, many of the framers of the Constitution warned of corruption. Oh, I should have done that earlier. Nice flag for the 13 colonies. I like that one. Um, Thomas Jefferson, in his commonplace book, written soon after uh, the Declaration of Independence, quoted the 17th century French lawyer Montesquieu, and he said, When once a republic is corrupted, there is no possibility of remedying any of the growing evils but by removing the corruption and restoring its lost principles. Every other correction is either useless or a new evil. And so despite the warnings and concern, corruption of course continued to find its way into American government. Starting in the early 1800s and for a hundred years thereafter, Tammany Hall, the New York political machine that played a huge role in shaping New York and national politics, dealt in substantial graft and corruption. Boss Tweed, that fella, a legendary Tammany figure, pushed the corruption to new levels after he won a seat in the New York State Senate. In 1873, Tweed was convicted and sentenced to 12 years in prison for his role in a corruption ring that cost New York City the equivalent of $1 billion today. Political corruption became uh, more of a concern for citizens. And in 1867, the first ever federal campaign finance law was passed. It was actually inside a naval appropriations bill, and it prohibited government employees from soliciting campaign contributions from naval yard workers. Um, however, it backfired on the majority party who worked to pass it. <coughs> At that time, the naval workers were a good chunk of funding and without it, political parties were forced to seek money from corporate interests and wealthy individuals. In 1907, the Tillman Act, named for a South Carolina senator, prohibited corporations from donating directly to campaigns. And although it didn't pertain to owners of the corporations, so many at the time saw it as ineffective. In 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act extended the corporate ban to include labor unions. And these laws were very ineffective rarely followed, and hardly ever enforced. <laughs> and in 1972, this fella here, his name is W. Clement Stone, an insurance magnate, he gave two million dollars directly to Richard Nixon's campaign. Uh, and that was uh, big money back then. And the clear appearance of corruption, in combination with the Watergate scandal, outraged many Americans and it led to an actual comprehensive <laughs> system of regulation and enforcement, including public financing of presidential campaigns and the creation of a central enforcement agency, the Federal Elections Commission, the FEC. And since then, the FEC has largely become defanged. It now consists of six members, three Republicans, three Democrats, and so they're always at a uh, standstill with nothing is ever fixed. So the FEC is a joke these days, in my opinion. Uh, there were also provisions that included limits on contributions to campaigns and expenditures by campaigns, individuals, corporations, and other political groups. And a mere two years later, let's see, 1972, no, four years later, uh, everything changed. So what happened in 1976 hovers over our politics to this very day and has led to the corruption that we've outlined here basically being codified into law. And so first, you, know, you, you ready for this, everybody? Watch this. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> there he is. There he is. <laughs> so who is that guy? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> That's right. So let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, 
When FDR initiated the New Deal, he told his rich friends, uh, he said, there's going to be people at the gate, and they're already there, and if you don't give up some of your money, this whole country is going to collapse. So you can either work with me so that we can have a country and you can make some money, or you can not work with me, <coughs> and you'll be taken out into the streets with those people. And so uh, they listened to him, and it led to the New Deal programs. And uh, they accepted ha much higher taxes to set up public works programs and uh, Social Security and un uh, unemployment insurance and all sorts of things that made the country thrive like it's never thrived before. But eventually, uh, the rich got sick of pain. Uh, and as the 50s and 60s um, played out, the Vietnam protests, the civil rights movement, um, all the hippies on the college campuses, the, uh, the rich didn't want to do it anymore. They didn't want to pay anymore. And so this fella here, let's, uh, let's do that again for fun. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Lewis Powell. Um, and he was a corporate lawyer who worked for the tobacco industry in the 60s and 70s. And he wrote a now very infamous memorandum to the American Chamber of Commerce in 1971. And the memo was supposed to be confidential, but it quickly leaked out. And here's an excerpt from that memo. The, it's the Powell Memorandum. If you put Powell Memorandum into your Google search, you can read it. Uh, <clears throat> quote, No thoughtful person can question that the American economic system is under broad attack. This varies in scope, intensity, in the techniques employed, and in the level of visibility. There always have been some who opposed the American system and preferred socialism or some form of statism, communism, or fascism. But what now concerns us is quite new in the history of America. What he said essentially in this memo was the country is being taken over by left-wing extremists, and he mentioned two in particular who were the worst of the radicals. One was Herbert Marcuso, who was, according to uh, Powell, running the universities, and the other was Ralph Nader. <laughs> with his radical consumer safety programs attempting to make vehicles safer and help bring on the EPA. And so in Powell's mind, American businesses were under constant threat and attack. He said, <laughs> Let's take this moment to do that again. Let's do that to the cell phone. Oh, I'm, okay, no, that, that's good. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that next time. He said in the, in the memo, we are not dealing with sporadic or isolated attacks from a relatively few extremists, or even from the minority socialist cadre. Rather, <coughs> the, the assault on the enterprise system is broadly based and consistently pursued. It's gaining momentum and converts. Powell said that Nader and Marcuso and their cohorts were undermining the business world, and his conclusion to the Chamber of Commerce was that we businessmen really run the country. We're the trustees and board members of the universities. We're the ones who have the resources. We should strike back and not let these unwashed lefties and young people and activists push us aside. We need to regain control. Lewis Powell went on to say that the business interests need to get more involved in the political process and leverage their wealth if they wanted to maintain their stature. And so these three quotes, there's two here and then one more slide um, from the memo, which seems stunning today, uh, given if, if you're paying attention to politics, uh, they give you a great idea of how Powell sought to remedy the situation that, that he thought was a problem. And so um, the first one here, as every, as every business executive knows, few elements of American society today have as little influence in government as the American businessman, <coughs> the corporation, or even the millions of corporate stockholders. One does not exaggerate to say that in terms of political influence with respect to the course of legislation and government action, the American business executive is truly the forgotten man. Aww. Yeah. Uh, and then this one. Business must learn the lesson long ago learned by labor and other self-interest groups. And this is the lesson that political power is necessary. That such power must be assiduously cultivated. And that when necessary, it must be used aggressively and with determination. Powell's plan sounded so good to Richard Nixon that he appointed him to the Supreme Court two months after he wrote the memo. <coughs> and then in 1976, Powell voted with the majority in the case Buckley versus Vallejo. 
And in Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976, the Supreme Court held that the limits on election spending <coughs> were unconstitutional. Two years later, in 1978, the Supreme Court case Bellotti v. the First National Bank of Boston, the court held that corporations have a First Amendment right to make political contributions. And the floodgates were opened. Between 1978 and 2010, the year the infamous Citizens United decision came down, money had already become the most important metric in how U.S. elections were decided. Citizens United is widely seen as a main problem, but in actuality what it did <coughs> was put an already corrupt system on steroids. <laughs> Buckley v. Vallejo and Bellotti v. Boston still allowed for a bit of curtailment in campaign spending. <coughs> Citizens United allowed for independent expenditures and unlimited spending by nonprofits, unions, and corporations. The impact of these three decisions is borne out in a study of economic trends. Uh, shortly after Buckley and Bellotti, the 1980 elections were held and the era of Ronald Reagan was upon us. The money began, began to flow freely into elections, and the results have been stark and obvious. And so in this quick video here, I think it's uh, five minutes, and uh, it'll give you a summary. And, and what it, um, what's based on, it'll tell you, it's, it's uh, it was done by the group Represent Us, which uh, is a group trying to get money out of politics, and the way they do it is uh, they introduced, they introduced uh, legislation in municipalities and states, so one city at a time, one state at a time. And what they're talking about here is a study by Princeton and Northwestern uh, that studied all sorts of, uh, all the legislation that came out of D.C. over a, I think, a 30-year period, and uh, here's what they found. For the last few years, I've had this sense that everything I learned as a kid about how America's government works is completely wrong. But I had no idea how bad things actually were until I saw this one graph. Researchers at Princeton University looked at more than 20 years worth of data to answer a pretty simple question. Does the government represent the people? Now, this is what they found. This axis here represents public support for any given idea. On the left, at 0%, are ideas that not a single American wants. On the right, at 100%, are ideas that everyone supports. This axis represents the likelihood of Congress passing a law that reflects any of these ideas, from a 0 to a 100% chance. On this graph, an ideal republic would look like this. If 50% of the public supports an idea, there's a 50% chance of it becoming law. If 80% of us support something, there's an 80% chance. You get the idea. Now, most Americans would probably agree that, with a few exceptions, we should be as close to this ideal as possible. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. Now, take an incredibly popular idea, the most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. This means that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. Put another way, and I'm just going to quote the Princeton study directly here, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. So if you've ever felt like your opinion doesn't matter and that the government doesn't really care what you think, well, you're right. But there's a catch. This flat line only accounts for the bottom 90% of income earners in America. Economic elites, business interests, people who can afford lobbyists, they get their own line. Look at how much closer their line is to the ideal. When they want something, the government is much more likely to do it. And when they don't, they have the power to completely block it from happening, no matter how much the rest of the country supports it. They get what they want, and guess who ends up paying for it? We pay for it with the most expensive healthcare in the world. We pay for it with a tax code that's a complete mess. We pay for it with internet that's slower and more expensive, with wasteful spending, a floundering education system, a catastrophic drug war, and one in five American children born into poverty. Almost every major issue we face as a nation can be traced back to this graph. How does this happen? Well, just follow the money. 
Right now, it's perfectly legal to buy political influence in America. Here's how it works. Let's say a big bank wants a law that would force taxpayers to bail them out again if they repeat the exact same reckless behavior that crashed the global economy in 2008. Not exactly the most popular idea with the public, and Congress knows that. That should be the end of it. But that's where the money comes in. It's perfectly legal for our bank to hire a team of lobbyists, whose entire job is to make sure that the government gives the bank what it wants. Then, those lobbyists can track down members of Congress who regulate banks and help raise a ton of money for their re-election campaigns. It's perfectly legal for those lobbyists to offer those same politicians million-dollar jobs at their lobbying firm. Then, those lobbyists can literally write the language of this new bailout law themselves and hand it off to the politician they just buttered up with campaign money and lucrative job offers. And it's perfectly legal for those politicians to take the lobbyist written language and sneak it through Congress at the last second. So now you've got a law that greatly benefits the banks and the whole process can start over. This is how a bill becomes a law. A special interest hires some lobbyists, those lobbyists collect campaign contributions, offer jobs, and then write the laws that Congress then passes to help those same special interests. This happens every day on every single issue with politicians of both parties. In the last five years alone, the 200 most politically active companies in the United States spent $5.8 billion influencing your government. Those same companies got 4.4 trillion in taxpayer support. And that's trillion, with a T. And that's just the top 200 companies. Never mind every other special interest, every union, every trade association, and every billionaire. Every single one of them can use their money to buy political influence. You know, there's this idea out there that this only became a problem after the Supreme Court Citizens United decision in 2010. But the data goes back almost 40 years, and the results are clear. Corruption is legal in America. And as long as it is, anyone who can spend money to buy political influence will. The solution here isn't rocket science. Make corruption illegal. We already know Congress won't do it. I mean, one look at this chart will tell you that. What we need is a plan that lets us go around Congress and do what the American people do best. Fix this mess ourselves. Well, good news. We have that plan and it's already working. Now that we've got the problem covered, let us show you how to be part of the solution. <clears throat> so Represent Us is uh, one of many groups with uh, all sorts of different plans. And in my opinion, they're wonderful people, but uh, passing legislation like they do doesn't always work. They, they managed to get um, the entire state of South Dakota to pass a, this a couple years ago, uh, to pass a, uh, um, pass a bill like severely curtailing campaign finance in the state of South Dakota. And like, they made contributions really low, they got rid of favors and all sorts of safeguards. And um, the South Dakota legislature called an emergency session shortly after that passed. Emergency session, that's it, it, usually for a catastrophe of weather related. And they went in there and they just overturned it. And so that's why I, I don't particularly, <coughs> I mean, God bless those people, but it's, it's not always going to work that way. And that's a great video. Um, <coughs> so, before we get to potential solutions, <coughs> let's talk about Wisconsin. This state used to be a shining example of good governance. Um, Fighting Bob Lafollette was a Midwest anti-corruption champion. And uh, as governor and U.S. senator and uh, presidential candidate, he spoke with fierce strength against corporate control and financial elite corruption. Uh, that bus still stands right outside of the uh, governor's office in Madison. But the governor comes in a different door, so he doesn't have to walk by it. Uh, that's true. <laughs> uh, <coughs> otherwise, he probably would have had it removed. Um, so by the time 2010 rolled around, Wisconsin was ripe for a takeover. Uh, Citizens United had just passed. Right-wing anti-Obama sentiment was in full swing. And a fellow named Scott Walker moved into the governor's mansion. Um, the Republican takeover of the Wisconsin legislature was massive and complete. The control of both chambers in the state house and the governorship signaled to interests across the country that Wisconsin was ready to be a grand petri dish of just how far campaign spending could go. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Not one single Wisconsin legislative candidate in the early 2000s ran for office on a platform of, I want to increase campaign contributions and make it harder for you to know where campaign spending is coming from. Nonetheless, in 2015, new laws were enacted in Madison that doubled contribution limits to candidates and more importantly allowed for unlimited spending by individuals to legislative campaign committees and no limits on what those campaign committees can give to candidates or spend on uh, outside expenditures, electioneering activities. At the national level, both parties raise relatively similar amounts of political money. And the big spending and lobbying interests in Washington are the pharmaceutical and health insurance companies, weapons manufacturers and other military companies, banking and financial interests and fossil fuel companies. These interests give to both sides at the national level and, and that has helped to maintain their prosperity across the partisan divide. <clears throat> at the state level, most of those interests don't hold as much control. And in Wisconsin, by far the biggest spending group is the Wisconsin Manufacturing and Commerce Group. They seem to have their tentacles in every piece of legislation that comes out of Madison. They spent $33 million on electioneering activities since 2006. That's independent expenditures, ads in favor or against candidates. $33 million. The Association of Realtors, the Dairy Business Association, the Tavern League, and many others spend big in Madison as well. Given the makeup of the state legislature over the past decade, the best investment for these groups is the Republican Party. Republican legislators had more than three times as much cash in their campaign accounts as the Democratic counterparts at the end of last year. Three times as much. <clears throat> so the four legislative campaign committees, the Assembly, Dems, and Republicans, and the Senate, Dems, and Republicans, had more than $5 million in their coffers at the end of last year. That's a 45% increase from the last report filed before the campaign finance changes in 2015. And this shows that the donors are getting their way and their investments are paying off in the form of tax breaks and credits, sweetheart deals, regulation rollbacks, and other changes in the law. So nationwide and statewide, our, our legislative houses have become auction houses. They're super wealthy and the people who run huge corporations see our politics as part of their business infrastructure. Many big businesses give to both parties to be sure they hold influence no matter who's in office. My favorite example that proves the problem using hard numbers and facts is this. In the mid-50s, corporate taxes, that's all the taxes collected by corporations, made up 30% of all the tax revenue collected by the government. 30%. In 2016, before the latest tax overhaul, before, uh, corporate taxes made up just 11% of all the taxes collected. Uh, and this didn't happen because the people wanted it. It happened because politicians from both parties work for the big donors. So what do we do about it? In Wisconsin, several things can be done at the state level. We could return to the rules that were in place before 2015. We could limit or ban corporations from giving to campaign committees. We could change conflict of interest laws to prohibit state officials from enacting laws that favor their big donors. We could help combat gerrymandering, which leads to favorable districts for big donors by implementing a nonpartisan scientific method of drawing district maps. We can implement full disclosure laws for donors and PACs and independent expenditures. And those are a few legislative fixes. But for many who study this issue and seek to find the most sensible way to keep corruption in the halls of power at bay, the solution is publicly financed elections. The thought is that if candidates have an equal amount of money allotted to them for their campaigns by the government, um, <clears throat> then the playing field will be leveled and big donors would lose their leverage. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. So let's explore how public financing works and if it's feasible. <coughs> let's explore some water first. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that during the video. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so countries all around the world use different forms of public financing. I haven't found one country that uses 100% public financing. Um, if you look at the OEDC countries, that stands for uh, or OEDC, what is it? Um, OEDC, uh, Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation, uh, and the, these countries are often cited as the 34 countries around the world that we can best compare the U.S. to economically and socially, uh, etc. <coughs> In Norway, look at that. 
Mm -hmm. I'll just leave that up there mm -hmm. for a while. <coughs> In Norway, the public or the government finances 74% of the political campaign spending. And the total spending is a fraction per capita of what we spend. In Mexico and Portugal, the government funds political parties but not candidates. In Australia, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, and Turkey, there are no limits on contributions and no limits on what candidates can spend. That sounds crazy to us, um, and so why is it that the corrup corruption doesn't run as wild in those countries as it does here? And there's several reasons for that. Uh, most of these OEDC countries have much stricter political parties, political party discipline than we do. So if you think of the land mass of these countries, uh, they're not that big, uh, so they don't have huge numbers of lawmakers, but at the same time, they have more parties. There's not just two parties like we have. There's all sorts of parties, and so they just end up being, being stricter. There's not, there's not a, a politician that you can pick out to go against their party. Um, it's a, it, it's a, they follow the, 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 party, um, the party line a lot closer. Um, <clears throat> and that's a lot different than how we do things here. And so just as an example, last week, uh, the rollback of banking regulations again that, that happened in the Senate in, in D.C. Um, the, uh, the donors were able to leverage several candidates. Uh, all the Republicans went along with it, but then they got a few Democrats that they needed to have their majority in the Senate. And Joe Manchin, Tim Kaine, Heidi Heitkamp, all the usual suspects from the Democratic Party who happen to vote with Republicans when their donors tell them to. Uh, and in these other countries, this, this practice is just unheard of. And, uh, and so the wealthy don't waste their time trying to buy politicians. They just, it's just not something that they do. Um, and perhaps more importantly, uh, in the vast majority of these countries, politicians are prohibited from advertising on TV or the internet or the radio. They just can't do it. I mean, look at them. They don't even watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and sometimes they're given free airtime on TV for debates or just interviews. Um, and in the United States, the lion's share of the money spent goes to TV ads and internet ads like this one. I assume this guy's name is Cole. <laughs> but, uh, um, and the other thing is the length of the election cycle. In the, in the U.S., it seems the election cycle goes on continuously. Yes. I mean, right after 2016, the next day, they're talking about who's, who's running for, for 2020. And that, and that makes sense because the TV stations get so much of that money, and so they like to promote it, and the primaries and the midterms, and, and it just goes on forever. But in these other countries, there are strict rules. And they differ from country to country, but sometimes it's just two months, sometimes it's six weeks that you have, and you, and you can't advertise. You, you, can, uh, you can knock on doors in a lot of places, but it's, not, it's just not what it is here. It's seen as a, a function of the government. You need uh, or a function of the country. You need a government to run it, and you, you select people who are willing to do it, who are honest, and, and then you do it. You, you, and they have their own beliefs, and you, you pick who you want. And it's, not, it's just not like it is here. Um, in the U.S., it's become a lucrative business. Consultants and bundlers and organizers get paid handsomely. They raise money, they spend money. And when the system is awash with money, and those who benefit do so handsomely, there will not be a serious push to reform it. In other countries, elections are not a business. And it might surprise you to learn that here in the U.S., there we are, there are several states with some form of public financing. You can see the the lobbyists are so powerful, they dragged Alaska down to the bottom of California <laughs> so, they could, so they could get the oil easier. Um, but there are some states with public financing. Maine, Connecticut, Florida, Hawaii, Maryland, Michigan, Arizona, North Carolina, New Mexico, Minnesota, Rhode Island, Vermont, West Virginia, and Massachusetts have some form of somewhere of a little bit of public financing. And the two main types of programs uh, that these states offer um, are called, usually fall into two categories, called either <coughs> clean election programs um, or programs that have matching funds. Um, the clean election programs are offered in Maine, Arizona, and Connecticut. Uh, candidates are encouraged to collect small contributions, no more than $5. Uh, 
from a number of individuals, depending on the position that they're seeking, to demonstrate that he or she has enough public support to warrant public funding of his or her campaign. And in return, the commission established for the program gives the candidate a sum of money equal to the expenditure limit set for the election. So the, the state legislature sets the amount that they think makes sense for that state. I heard an interview with a congressional candidate from Maine the other day, and she is running against, uh, she's a Democrat, running against a Republican incumbent. She went out and got $5 donations from 500 people. 500 people gave her $5 each. And she, and she that money goes into the state pool, and then it fluctuates each year, and they, depending on what happens, they, they change the amount, but then she gets $500,000 for a congressional run. It's less for a state seat, it's uh, less for a state judicial seat, and, and depending on and what you're running for, more for a senator. Um, and so that's how it works in the uh, clean election programs. Um, Wisconsin had a publicly financed system for state candidates, governors, and judicial nominees for 33 years. And then it was defunded in 2011 by Governor Walker and the Joint Finance Committee. And, and, it, and you know, it, plays, it plays easy to people because, and I think I say something about that here, it's, politics has become so much of that ad that you see all the time and when you're scrolling on the internet and you see on TV and you're just bombarded with it and, and because of the control, uh, a lot of people see politics through a national lens and they see a pendulum swing from left to right and not huge changes not happening in their lives, especially since 1976 when this happened. And so they're fed up with politics, fed up with politicians, you know, half the people don't vote. And so when you uh, have a governor come out and say, did you know that some of your tax dollars are going to pay for political campaigns? I want to get rid of it. People are like, hell yes, let's get rid of it. Because they don't trust politicians. Um, so none of the U.S. public finance systems are mandatory. Um, they're only optional. Even when state legislatures meticulously draw up a system that strives for clean elections, they can't make it mandatory. Uh, this is because of the precedent set by the Supreme Court decisions. Um, so in order to get past that, I believe we need to constantly push for stark language and tangible examples of how our political system um, favors those wealthy, uh, those wealthy people, just like in that video you saw laid out there. In, in strict terms so that people start to understand just, you know, you, they, they don't want their tax dollars going to pay for campaigns publicly, but you got to make them, or try to make them understand that far more of their tax dollars are going uh, when, it's, when it's financed privately to all sorts of giveaways to those, uh, those donors. Um, let me see what I got next here. Oh, look at those guys. Um, I believe the U.S. has gone so far in our legalized corruption that we need to become the first country to publicly fund elections 100%. We need a sea change. We've become the most powerful country in the world, and unfortunately that power is not being wielded by the people as it was intended. It's being wielded by the corporations and wealthy individuals who control our government through the politicians that they buy. We must remember that democracies are very fragile. They fall all the time, they come and go, and we're, we're relatively young. We're in a constant battle to fight human greed, and we must fight it with sensibility and righteous anger and fierce compassion. We must completely end the legalized bribery. You know, they talk about how the Russians influenced the last election. Uh, they spent a couple million dollars on Facebook ads and, and Twitter trolls. Well, the Koch brothers have pledged to spend 800 million on the midterms alone, and that's just that. And we need to pound home the message that money will not save us. Not Sheldon Adelson on the right, not Tom Steyer on the left. It's just you, you can't rely on billionaires, and the money's not going to save us. It's not a simple matter of unfairness or inequality. Those who have purchased our government deal in predatory finance. They deal in war. They deal in profiting off of human illness and suffering. And they curtail the move to save our planet from ecological catastrophe. Changing our campaign finance system is not a mere systemic political issue. It's a matter of life and death, not only for us, but for every other country we influence in the world. The main hurdle in getting to a publicly financed system is that any push for public financing will be slapped down by lawsuits citing precedent. The lawsuits will note that in Buckley v. Vallejo, the court said money is speech. 
And we need to start considering Buckley and Bilotti and Citizens United and McCutcheon in the same way we consider the Three-Fifths Compromise and the Dred Scott decision. It stains on our democracy. Embarrassments that must be rectified before it's too late. We need to harness public outrage and demand of our friends and neighbors that we push our lawmakers to make the necessary changes to amend the Constitution. To say strongly and firmly that money is not speech, corporations are not people, and that if our country does not rapidly deal with this problem, this American experiment will soon come to an end. And Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist and thinker, said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So we need to move forward together. We need to remove the greed. We need to remove the money. And if our politicians are funded by private interests, they're going to work for private interests. And if they are publicly funded, they work for the public. As simple as that. Thank you. So, I don't know if I'll be able to answer questions, or, but I'd love to try if anybody has any, or <coughs> any suggestions, or any comments that you have, or anything I, you, uh, that you want to add. What do you think is uh, an approach uh, for the state of Wisconsin that um, is, is, you know, to work toward uh, uh, Financing or campaign finance reform that would uh, you know what's the approach that would would uh, be effective here in Wisconsin? Well, I you know I I think like I said the the rules that changed in 2015 were pretty drastic uh, and they can be changed back without a, without a Supreme Court challenge. They doubled the contribution limits, which I don't even think was that big a deal. I, I think that as you would if it was publicly financed. Um, you'd have to raise that eventually because costs go up. And they only doubled, like uh, right now an assembly person can raise a maximum $1,000 from somebody and before 2015 it was 500, uh, Senate it was 1,000, now it's 2,000. And that's pretty, pretty much small fries, but what really changed was letting, um, was what goes to campaign committees and what goes into independent expenditures. And so, it's tripled the amount of money just since 2015 um, that goes into the campaign committees and they are allowed to just divvy that out to candidates. So if you look at campaign finance filings and the Republicans have three times as much money as the Democrats, um, everyone, every candidate who runs for an assembly seat, there are 99 of them, um, as, soon, as soon as they announce on the Republican side, it's boom, there's 25 grand. In, in their coffers from the Republican Assembly Committee. Cool. Uh, I know Charlie's running against Warren Petrick. He ran unopposed, unopposed in 2016, and he got 16 grand. He and has about 180,000, I think. Already, right. But he got 16 grand from that committee running unopposed, and what that does is that tells him something uh, that he's supposed to do. But to answer, oh, your, but to answer your question, that for me, the first the first um, step is to educate people because they don't know. And when I when I talk to the legislators in my in my uh, volunteer work, they love that uh, those limits that are set. And they say, "What's the big deal? I can only take this much." But they never tell you about that other huge funds of money coming in. And even though there are these Supreme Court decisions, if you have a majority in the Assembly and the Senate, you can go back to those old rules. You can you can limit. Um, corporations and individuals from giving huge money to those campaign committees. And, I mean, they, it's, a, it's a long law uh, bill that, that, that was written in 2015, and it has all these interesting ways that PACs can give to committees, committees can give to PACs, committees can give to candidates, and it's this big circle of make sure there's a ton of money coming in. That's how you get the Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce spending $33 million. So, I mean, it would be huge if we could just go back to, to pre- uh, 2015 levels. And then I think what needs to happen um, in, in addition to electing enough people in the, at the federal level to have uh, enough, uh, a majority enough to, to propose a constitutional amendment that, that might have some teeth, you need to have some states which are supposed to be the, um, you know, the, the laboratories of, of new law uh, come up with 
to have several states make laws that might be opposed to those Supreme Court decisions and take them back there again. And right now the makeup of the court uh, is such that they probably wouldn't be overturned. But, uh, you know, hopefully uh, Justice Ginsburg stays on for a while and then things shift for those of us who want to get money out of politics. But there are a lot of things you can do at the state level uh, to curtail it. Yeah, so how do you fund uh, public financing? Uh, by just signing up for more taxes, right? That's right, yeah. Um, but the, the point is that so much, so much more of your tax dollars goes to, on the whole of everybody, already goes to favors for, for the donors, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, bills that are, that are written to favor them. Uh, just for example, you know, Foxconn is a big example uh, that's now ballooned over four billion. But there are all sorts of different smaller examples that don't get in the news. Has, that, has anybody analyzed that to say so they can present that as an argument? For yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's got all the numbers, but I, I see it and I, I bring that up to people. And I mean, there's there's in lacrosse just this last year. There's uh, the Quick Trip company. Mm -hmm. it has, it has a $300 million um, expansion they're doing for a huge, I think, two gas station complexes down there. And the government just gave them uh, $21 million. Uh, and, the, and the reasoning is it's economic development, it's jobs, but the fact is that the people who own that, they don't need that money. <laughs> but they, they're huge donors, too. So what you tell people is, is here's the amount of money, uh, and, if, and if I were to write up a plan, uh, for, for what it would cost to publicly finance, then I'd have to dive into those numbers with the help of people who are better at the numbers. I'm saying do that, but then compared to what's going on right. now. Do do? So how do those, those states that do some of that, how do they, how do they get justified? Yeah. How do they, how do they, well, they have through the vote? In, the yeah, in order, like, I think in Maine they had a, a, a referendum, a statewide referendum to, okay. on the ballot to, okay. to get that. They didn't <coughs> they pass a lot. Uh, and so they must have sold it to them so John, it, it sounds to me like that the, the way we can revert back to pre-2015 uh, regulations would be by electing, uh, I don't want to necessarily say Democrats, but people who are against the power of money in government. Mm -hmm. And we've got some barriers against that, I think, in the form of uh, gerrymandering and uh, voter suppression. Yeah. Uh, so we've got to overcome those in order to, to overcome, uh, in order to. Well, thankfully, there, in the last couple of Supreme Court uh, rulings on the gerrymandering have have, have, uh, have gone in favor of, of having some uh, some lines drawn more sensibly, just because mm -hmm. it's gotten so maddening. And there's several states, California, more but most notably, that has. Uh, supposedly nonpartisan people drawing them. It's worked better. I mean, it's tough to, for people to be nonpartisan, but um, that's, that is a big part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we've been working hard for uh, United to Amend, Amend the Constitution. And all we're asking for is a referendum statewide where all the people in the state can vote and say, please. Wisconsin, join the other 19 states that have already committed to this change of the Constitution. That, but what I see is one of the biggest problems we have is the media does not want it. The media is handling, the only reason they exist anymore, the newspapers can't make it, but with all these political ads, it keeps them alive. So they don't want to let go of that. And so they're not our friends on this, on this issue. And it means that we have to be smart enough to take them on, too. So not only are you taking on your opposition politically, you have to take on the media and, of course, the corporations. Oh, it's, it's a big, you know, it's a big step to take. But the only people that can do it is us. And we have to wake up and realize we are it. Yeah. Well, I think it's encouraging. Um, to see the younger generation coming up because they they just don't they don't have, watch as much cable TV, you know. And, and they, they are, these high school kids are doing <laughs> after the massacre in Florida. 
Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 well, okay, I'm, I'm a young guy in this room. But, you know, the tie-dye generation and um, in the 70s, we, we, we kicked Nixon's butt. And now, I was quite proud to see these high school kids gather together, and it shows how damn smart they are. Yeah. And, you know, and Lincoln was a Republican, so it's not a matter of party, and it's not a matter of money, because my spiritual teacher says it's just a form of God energy with money. So you can't say it's bad. Yeah. But I'd just like to emphasize what these high school kids are doing. And it is really, it makes America mm -hmm. look good, and then countries around the world see this. And I, I remember, my last thing I'll say is I remember that one guy standing in front, in front of those tanks in Tiananmen Square. One damn person, Boston that's Tea Party. Yeah, oh, that's right. And I think it's a, a byproduct of, <clears throat> of, you know, the, the people say that the kids need to turn off their computers and their phones, but, but a byproduct of being bombarded with so much information from everywhere. And they can choose from a million different things to watch, a million different videos. Uh, there's YouTube is overflowing with them, and, and your Twitter and Facebook feeds are just all over the place. But I think what that naturally develops, and I'm not a, a scientist, but is, is a really good BS detector, because they, if they see somebody on there who's not authentic, they're just like, eh, I'm not going to waste my time watching four seconds of that. So they're not, they don't watch Chuck Todd. You know, they, they, because it's just, it's, it's regimented and fake. And they, they, they're, they're, news, they're news anchors <coughs> on, on YouTube who say what they want to say, and they just say it authentically, and then there are news actors on the TV who just read from a script. And so the, the, the generation, even if they're not politically active, they necessarily like, uh, can tell what's real and what's not. And, it, and it's sort of a race for them to, turn, to get to the activist and uh, voting age before everything collapses. <laughs> and so, well, hopefully, hopefully it's a real celebration. That's right. Just a, a question or comment about uh, like the Assembly District 29, as it, as is true in, in the 10th Senate District, that there's not uh, the ability to purchase uh, mass media is kind of limited because uh, it's so expensive. It's the Twin Cities. I don't know if there if there were any ads in the 10th Senate special election in that, I, but. Well, Claire doesn't really cover the area very well, so there's not a lot of TV. So it, it seems to me it's more possible to run a clean campaign in an area like that because the big money can't buy that bombardment of, you know. Yeah. I don't well, know about Facebook. Yeah, it's true, and, and, it's, and it's not. They they are into the internet now too. No. And it's not just mm -hmm. Facebook. Okay. It's yeah. all sorts of places that you that you go and there you'll see. Little like little local radio. Local radio is pretty well bombarded by the uh, big money. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Ads. They go everywhere. But I hear it around here. <laughs> but you know, it's just it, it's a lot of education. It's a lot of talking to people to point it out and and let people know that it's not just we gotta we gotta fight the the, the money power. Um, I think a lot of people, I mean, you, you're, you all came to this room and I've seen a lot of you before, so you're concerned and you understand what, what happens, but so many people don't know how much of an effect that politics in general, money aside, has on their, on their life. Uh, even at the state level, I didn't know until eight or ten years ago how, how much uh, state legislatures, how much power they have and how many changes they can make in an instant that affect you and your family. and so. And for most people, it's not it's not telling people that you see at work or or friends to to you know get up and drop what they're doing and and join some groups and fight and dedicate a ton of their time. It's just it's just voting and, and spreading the word about telling people how much their lives are affected by decisions in Madison will will help them get to the point of of, of fighting the money with their with their votes. You know? So that's really important too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey. Looks like my kids are gone. <laughs> I can take their place. I can. I can. The friends back there look pretty good to me, actually. Who's the cutest in the room? <laughs> Were the students aware of this presentation? Do you know? Yeah, they're, they're aware. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I think that it's announced, you know, like a week before, and then probably today it was announced again. 
and I went out and tried to rally them to come in the room, but mm. they're busy in uh, Dungeons and Dragons and, and <laughs> studying and study groups and you know they're very pleasant to talk to, but they don't respond. Mm. Yeah, I can just say we did the student association did put posters up about two weeks ago um, in all of our academic buildings and all the dorms. Oh, and everything. great! So we did have advertising. We did try and get people here. I'm kind of sorry that it didn't show up, but it was a great presentation. You tried. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having us. That's good stuff. Yeah. I'd also like to say that, you know, you can't blame politics because we elected Tricky Dick Nixon in. He what God didn't come down and put him in. We put him in there. We elected him in. And you know, if there's one place to start, you've got your home and you got your neighbor to your right and your neighbor to your left. And then it goes to a block, and then it goes to a county. And then it goes to the Boston Tea Party, and you know, thank God George Washington crossed the river and kicked the Hessians' ass. That's right. So just you know, know your neighbor to your left and to your right. You get the block, and it just keeps building because that's how this country was founded: Boston Tea Party, and you know, and, and uh, I mean, the, the British outnumbered us, they outgunned us, they out had everything, but we just uh, got a stiff back and went for it. And it didn't matter if you were Republican or Democrat. You know, of course, they didn't exist back then, but that's that. I'd like to say I've been out on the campaign trail out mm -hmm. in St. Croix County because we're trying to pass a referendum for Wyuda, which is Wisconsin United to amend. Mm -hmm. And people are wonderful. I've been going door to door in, Bal in Baldwin for three weekends. Yay! <laughs> wow. Well, it's fun. And people are usually very pleasant. You know, if they answer the door, come to the door, they're very pleasant. It's wonderful to talk to the people. And whether they're, you know, being just nice to you, but they, I think they listen. I went to one man that I talked to on the street, and then I happened to end up at his door last Saturday, and he gave me word for word, you know, what was, this was about, mm -hmm. trying to get, you know, the money out of politics and, you know, get the government to the people. So, I mean, it is worthwhile even though it seems to be a hard thing to do, is to get out, even if you don't know the people, get out and talk to the people. Now, we have a couple candidates, you know, in the room, and I'm sure they're much more effective than I am when I'm going door to door, but, you know, I still think it's a very rewarding thing to do, is to talk to people, you know. Most people are great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. No, that's, that's true, Ed. Question back home. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I hope people know that we need to work to keep politics out of our money, too, that there is a statewide referendum on April 3rd saying that we should asking to do away with the state treasurer mm -hmm. and yeah. instead have the lieutenant governor manage our money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's a place where our lack of news media doesn't serve us because a lot of people weren't knowing. It's going out on email lists and everything else for people mm -hmm. to know. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a, yeah, I know we're not supposed to be partisan, but but that's something else that that the money does. It, it, it peels away any watchdogs of where the taxpayer money goes. And, and, and the current administration has, <clears throat> over the years, made less and less what the duties of the treasurer are, little by little, piece by piece. Mm -hmm. And what treasurers are, are for, what they what they have been for uh, historically, is to take care of, of the money and to make sure. Because, like I said at the beginning, corruption is just a, a normal human thing. And if you have power, you end up, in the, for the most part, trying to use it. And, and you, you have to you have to keep people uh, accountable. And that's what the treasurer does. And now they've wheeled, they've uh, whittled away at, at the duties so much that they're like, what do we need this for? And and we do need it. And it's not a it's not an exciting story for the press to cover, but, but I think you're right. I think it's a great thing to bring up. I'll just share, John. I, I've sent letters to the editor about the third and the election and it begging people not to vote no. Uh, I've sent it to 45 different papers. Um, I don't know if any of them have published. Thank you. But, you know, you got to try. And if yep. they hear more and more from more people, eventually they'll have to publish something. But we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, no, that's true. There's a citizen journalist in uh, <coughs> River Falls, Thomas Smith, who regularly sends letters to the editor. He did one on, on this issue and reported to me that he got a lot of publication. So, mm -hmm. 
kind of got widely circulated. On. Thomas Smith, yeah, he's cool. Um, we were just over in Hudson, and Leek and Mike were over there, and you were over there also, mm -hmm. Charlene. Uh, and they said there's a Wheeler report that lets you know what's going on in the state. And for the people in Hudson, they say, we don't get news from Wisconsin, we just get news from the mm -hmm. Twin Cities. So how do we find out what's going on in the state? Well, I think all you have to do is, is go into your internet and look for Wheeler report, and it will tell about what's happening with our legislators. That's, Can you tell us about the Wheeler where report? I, that's where I go all the time. It's, okay. uh, <clears throat> and, uh, some friends from my volunteer group turn me on to it. It's my favorite thing. I look at it every morning. So Monday through Friday, uh, they don't do on the weekend. But it's just thewheelerreport.com, W-H-E-E-L-E-R, all one word, the Wheeler Report. And it, it, uh, the people who work there scour the state and the country. You know, they, on their internet searches, they just put in the word Wisconsin, and anything that comes up, they've got state and local things, and uh, they are in cahoots with the each legislative office in Madison. So when those offices put out a, a uh, press release, it automatically goes to the Wheeler Report. And so when you look at the site, it's pretty bare bones and basic, and it's just a scroll down list for the time next to it for when it came up. And and it's broken up into governor, legislative, statewide. Um, and it's just a fantastic resource to, because mm -hmm. I, I, I share it a lot, because people say, where did, how did you find the Wisconsin Law Review? And I'm like, I, I didn't search it, I found it on the Wheeler Report. <laughs> and so I don't know who those people are, but it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, other things, um, wispolitics.com covers a lot of stuff. Um, I am currently trying to take up some of the slack. In this part of the state, it was community. So that there are, and there are bloggers from the state who do a pretty effective job, yeah. too. That's true. And because the, there's so much going on. I mean, just yesterday, the Senate voted on 100 different bills, 100 in one day, which is just maddening. And they, I mean, they're, they're in session, I mean, the session is officially uh, open from January, of the election was 2016, so the inauguration is January 2017, and it's open until, you know, a few weeks from now. And that's not to say it's a floor session, but anything introduced right after inauguration is a live bill until a couple of weeks from now. So it's like a year and a half, and they cram everything into to two days. And then it's just madness. And they, I mean, these people make decent money. It's a good job, and they they could do more of that. And they could. And then what happens is, in the last flurry of a couple days, they slip in amendments here and amendments there, and so much is happening. The president, <coughs> yeah. And then they don't have public comment on, on new amendments, which sometimes drastically change uh, legislation. I don't know what the answer is to that, but uh, it's crazy. And and. And, 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 you know, and, and following those things, you know, aside from money and politics, I mean, it's always all connected, it's always in there, but the, the taking away of, of the power of communities is just systemic. The, the Senate passed yesterday in one of their 100 bills, uh, something that the Assembly passed a few weeks ago that says if Menominee or Madison or Hudson or Appleton or anywhere wants to say, hey, uh, let's get our city council together and, and uh, let's let's make our minimum wage here in Menominee, I don't know, 850 instead of 750 or whatever it is. You can't do it. If, if Madison says, let's offer better uh, benefits to our employees, let's raise our minimum wage because it's a higher cost of living to live here, and we want people to come and live here, now you can't do it. And the governor is going to sign it. It passed the assembly and the Senate. Mm -hmm. It's And it's happening in other states, and it's model legislation mm -hmm. handed to them. And what they tell the press is, these, these businesses are just so confused, and, and it's a patchwork of laws, and how can these poor people understand that, that you have to pay more money when you do jobs in Milwaukee? Like there's some idiots walking into the wall, like, I'm so confused. Like, like no, but, they, but the reason they do it is because they want the companies who pay for the politicians don't want to have to pay higher minimum wages, yeah. and on top of that, they know that in, in the vast majority of studies, if you raise the minimum wage, if you have better benefits for people, they will spend that money in the community, it helps the economy thrive, and so if it works in one area, then it starts to catch on. And people are saying, hey, it, it, if it worked in Oshkosh, maybe we should do it in Racine. And, and they don't want it to catch on because they'll have to pay a little more money. And it's, yeah. it's gross. 
And so there's so much, and that just happened yesterday as one of the 100 bills. Hmm. And it's tough to keep track of it all, but you gotta, hmm. gotta stay vigilant. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.